Dr. Mag. Yes, ma'am. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Doing great. Doing great. Good All to see right. you. Good to see you as well. Yes, Got a little bit different setup this week. Yep, yep, yep. I got you. Yeah, trying to uh, make sure everybody understands what they have to do. Mask up and vote. Mask up right. and vote. November 3rd can't get here fast enough. Exactly. But, uh, how are you doing this week? Doing great. Busy, busy, busy week. A um, lot of stuff going on. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, doing good. Thank God it's Friday. Yeah, absolutely. TGIF. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. It's it's I don't know. It seems like it was a little crazier this week for whatever reason. And um, uh, I even find myself being a little busier this afternoon than I anticipated. And so uh, I but I know that we are uh, definitely motivated to to bring the weekly updates as yes. we've been doing for the past few months. And, uh, you know, it's, it's I don't know. It seems like it's a little. um I don't know. The energy is a little different today, Dr. Mack. I think it's because of some, you know, what we know is happening with the numbers and reporting right. and and all that good stuff. And, you know, so it'd be great to hear from from our viewers today. Thank you so much, Terry Dow McLean, for tuning in. I'm glad you caught it today, too. Uh, make sure you share it. And um, but it would be great to hear from the viewers as far as, you know, their thoughts on, uh, you know how they're feeling about everything. Uh, classes start for a few, a couple of the colleges next week, actually Monday, and then uh, LEAP program has already started in Horry County for some students. Yeah. And uh, I think we're still on point to begin September eighth in Horry County, but uh, not quite sure of you know what is set in stone right now. We're still working on trying to get a, a, another guest from Horry County School District to come on come on board and, and tell us a little bit uh, uh, to kind of give us updates, I guess, on, on what we can expect. Uh, but today, of course, we are going to go over the COVID-19 updates and uh, we welcome your questions and your comments. Let us know, uh, you know where you are, where you're watching from and what's going on in your area. And, you know, we'll definitely make this as lively a conversation as possible. You know, you're going to get the truth from Dr. Mack. And that's what I appreciate about uh, being with him every single Friday at four, just talking about what's going on with COVID-19. And uh, so Dr. Mack, I know you normally roll out with a few numbers before we get to the slides. So go ahead and, and right. make it happen. Well, yes. Uh, um, glad to be here, April, again. Uh, and you know, really, um, we'll kind of start the way we're going today. You know, we're going to hit the numbers like we normally do. And then we're going to hit uh, some highlights, some points on what's going on and some observations that I've seen based off of the numbers. And then from there, we'll kind of open it up to questions uh, and see if we can have a little bit more time for questions if, 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 there, if there are the questions there. Mm -hmm. So numbers wise, uh, worldwide in the last seven days, the total number of cases have gone from around 21 million to around 23 million number of cases uh, worldwide in the past week, two million increase. The number of deaths have gone from around the worldwide have gone from around 760,000 to right at 800,000 deaths worldwide. In the United States, in the last week, the number of cases have gone from 5.4 a million to 5.7 million, so around 300,000. The number of deaths have gone from 171,000 to right at a, a little over 178,000 in the last week. So that's about 7,000 more deaths in the last week. Um, South Carolina, the number of cases have gone from 104,000 cases to a little over 109,000 cases in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And the number of deaths in South Carolina have gone from a little over 2,200 to approximately 2,500 deaths in South Carolina. Specifically in Horry County, the number of cases have gone from a little over 8,700 to right at uh, 9,000 cases. And the number of deaths in the last week have gone in South in Horry County, the number of deaths has gone from 161 to 177 cases. Georgetown County, um, the number of cases have gone from 1,500 to uh, to 1,630 uh, cases, 
and the number of deaths in Georgetown County have gone from 25 to 33. Uh, Marion County, the number of cases have gone from 575 to 625 cases, and the number of deaths in Marion County have gone from 14 to 17. Hmm. Okay, that's kind of where we are right now. Now, there's some observations on here that I'll get to um, in a little bit, but um, but we can start with the slides right now. Okay, all right. Share your slide deck and. <clears throat> And again, if you have any questions or comments for us, please uh, feel free to post them and we would uh, definitely talk about it. OK. Yeah. So as I said earlier, this kind of is, is more of a schematic on what's happening um, in the U.S. Um, as we see, um, we did hit a hump up definitely in the month of July. And there is some appears to be somewhat of a of a dropping off. However, you know, as I'll say in several slides that we'll see, the, the amount of testing in a lot of places in the United States has slowed down. Um, and we'll talk about that more now and more in a minute. But I just want to kind of show this schematic so we can just see exactly what's happened. Even though it appears the numbers coming down, we're not quite sure what that means. Is it because less people are testing? Is it still because it's getting taking labs longer to get the results back? Mm -hmm. um, or is it because the numbers are actually dropping off? Only time will really tell that. But if we see, we're still higher than we were back in March and April and May and June. OK, next slide. New cases. Again, the top slide is probably uh, one of the most uh, kind of maybe even deceiving, if for lack of a better word, slides, because we do see the numbers coming down. Again, still far higher than I said. These are new cases um, at higher than in March and April and uh, May and June. But we just don't know what the, that drop off means right now, because we certainly know, particularly around here. And we'll get to that in a little bit, a little bit, is that the number of people that are testing is, has dropped off, quite frankly. I mean, we've had lots of tests that were being done. Um, two to th sometimes two to three testing events a week. Mm -hmm. Now we have had maybe three in the last three weeks. So the number of testing has dropped down. Um, however, the bottom slide still shows that the number of deaths are still averaging uh, over a thousand a day. And that's been consistently for the last uh, three weeks. Now, certainly back in April and May, when those numbers of deaths were really high, that's when New York, New Jersey, uh, Illinois, Louisiana, those states were getting hit extra hard. Um, and we see that they'd come down, but those numbers are still up and there's still over a thousand deaths a day. Hmm. In other words, you know, um, there's a couple days, you know, one day specifically, we had 1,500 deaths. I mean, in a day. I mean, that's eight, seven, thirty-seven is crashing. So, so that in one day. So mm. that's really significant. You're still talking about a thousand people a day dying. So again, that's significant. Next slide. This slide basically goes over um, the number of deaths in the last seven days per hundred thousand people. So again, for South Carolina to be able to be compared with Texas or Florida, you have to find some common denominator. And in medicine and in statistics, we use it per 100,000 residents. So as you see, South Carolina is still up amongst the lead. Mississippi is six per 100,000. Florida is five. Louisiana, five. South Carolina is right there at four. Mm -hmm. So that is still a significant amount compared to a state as small as South Carolina. OK, so again, that's something still to be aware of and, and not let numbers deceive you on what it's saying. Uh, you can get a number to say anything you want to, but I'm just giving you the real story on this. And when you when you compare it to 100,000, that really kind of makes you compare apples to apples. And you mm -hmm. see what South Carolina is when that variable is taken into play. Next. South Carolina, as I said earlier, um, there is um, over 100,000 uh, cases, total cases. Um, and as I said earlier, um, there's, uh, you know, and that, that actually was from, um, uh, it's actually a little bit closer to 20, 2,500, a little bit closer to 2,500 from DHEX data. Mm. It came from New York Times, uh, but it's a little bit higher than this in South Carolina. Okay. 
Next slide. Okay. Again, specifically in South Carolina. Now, the top slide is 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 a slide that you know I've been watching. What I knew was going to happen. Again, with less testing being done compared to where they were before, you will it will look like there's fewer cases. Let's, they, they can only report what they see. Mm -hmm. So if fewer people testing, there's going to be there's going to be fewer cases that are going to be likely to be there. So the number will come down statistically as opposed to if you test it more, you have a larger sample size and more likely to get more positive tests. Mm -hmm. However, the slide underneath is the real story where you're still seeing a significant number of, of deaths and much higher again compared to April, May, and June. Even though it appears those numbers are coming down, that's really the real test and real information is because that's telling you really what's happening. And these are covert related deaths in South Carolina, still high. Hopefully that number coming down is a good sign, but again, only time will truly tell. Mm -hmm. the, top, the top graph is, is just deceiving because there's just fewer people testing. Okay, next slide. Okay, on, on this slide, um, it, you know, let's, um, on this one, you know, epidemiologists and people who study these things really try to look at trying to find ways to quantify how many deaths are really happening due to COVID. Because we know that there's some people that are dying that are di have died before they actually have been tested. So what this slide does, which is a very important slide, and it's a telling slide, is when you compare March 15th, to, eight, to August the 8th, over the past several years, compared to this year, there's 4,000 more deaths this year compared to, to, to other years during the same time period. Mm. Now, the reason that's important is that's going to be likely to cover deaths related to COVID that haven't been diagnosed as COVID. Mm, okay. So let me say this again. March the 15th through August the 8th, they compared previous years to this year. And there's 4,000 more deaths. Now, now, the concern is, is that we know there's only 2,500 people that have been reportedly died due to COVID. So where are these other 1,700 deaths coming from? Mm -hmm. And why are they more now this year than compared to other years? Some of us, because some of those people died from COVID-related um, deaths that were not diagnosed. Some of them died with heart attack strokes that may have been related to stress, anxiety, worry related to COVID. Some of it may be related to the fact that some of these people couldn't get their medications for whatever reason. Some of these people didn't go to the hospital or go to the doctor's office because they were afraid to go. So it's it, it that's a very telling sign because a lot of times when you look at it, you know, the thought is, is that, you know, how do you accept, you know, um, assess an impact on a virus or a pandemic in a community? Mm -hmm. And you do it based off of overall death. So the indirect and direct deaths that are related to COVID-19. But just to give you an idea, this year, March 15th through August the 3rd, compared to previous years, there's 4,000 more deaths in South Carolina. Hmm. So I want to put that slide in so that way people can understand, because that's going to capture the people who died from COVID that wasn't diagnosed. That's going to capture people who have indirectly been who have died from pneumonia, other things that may not have had the diagnosis of COVID at the time of death. So that's why this graph is so important because it gives you an overall picture. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to throw that one in there. Um, and for most places, the numbers are significantly high. So let me say this nationwide. There's been 224,000 more deaths during the same time period. 
So in South Carolina, it was just 4,000 more excess deaths. Nationwide, it's 224,000 more. Hmm. So again, that kind of lets you know the direct and the indirect effect that COVID can take on, 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 on people and what's going on for different reasons. Okay? So I just want to throw that one in there. Um, the next one. Um, there, there's another uh, thing that's talked about with, uh, with you know, the deaths. And, and certainly we know that, you know, over the last three weeks continuously, although the number of cases, as I said earlier, appear to be dropping down, the number of deaths is still averaging over a thousand a day for the last three weeks. That's, that's, that's staggering. A thousand people a day. I mean, you know, that are dying. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're talking six, seven, seven thirty-seven aircrafts crashing a day, every day for the last three weeks. So I give these numbers to give them, not to create fear, but just to give education. These are the numbers that we're talking about. And when you see numbers where it appears that the number of cases are going down, well, that could just be a fact that it is not tested. What are the deaths? What's happening with the deaths? These deaths for the last three weeks, almost a month since July 20, I think since July the 21st, there may have been five to six days where it's been less than a thousand deaths a day. So just to make that point clear so everybody can understand we you know, by the end of this weekend, we'll be over a hundred thousand, 180,000 deaths. Okay. You said right. by this week, there will be, say that one more time. So, so what I'm saying is that in, in, in the, in the United States, mm -hmm. as, as right now, about 170,000 deaths. Okay. By the end of this weekend, there will be, well, by the time Monday comes, there'll probably be over 180,000 people that have died. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're averaging over 1,000 deaths a day. Mm -hmm. That's been for the last month, with the exception of maybe four or five days. So, again, the number of cases. That doesn't mean a whole lot. I mean, it, it does, but it really doesn't if you're not testing with the same frequency. Okay. If you're not testing the same frequency, then you're going to have lower numbers because you've got a smaller sample size. Mm -hmm. So the, the numbers essentially are, are, in terms of cases, are quite deceiving. They are because that could, that could just be a fact of you're not testing. Just like, not the president, like the president said, just stop testing. Well, yeah, if you just stop testing, it will go away like he said. Mm -hmm. It will just vanish and disappear because you're not testing. Mm -hmm. So so that that's the issue there. And this slide is, is what it took me a minute to find this slide and find this information. But as you see, on the left of each one of these slides, it's ramping up. So what that means is the number of tests that these labs will get, public health labs, clinical labs at like research institutions, universities, and commercial labs like Quest and LabCorp. If you see the numbers are going up to a certain point, and now you see these numbers are coming down, that means these labs are getting fewer tests. The lab, this graph is kind of this lab is uh, graph is kind of small, but it's not really what's on the slide on the, the x and y axis that's important. What's important is what the graph is actually doing. And to the far right, when you see those numbers are coming down, that means those labs are getting fewer tests because and testing, found, because huh? because there there's less testing. Exactly. Yeah, because there's less testing. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. All right. So that's what these three slides mean. As you see, and these are these are where the tests are being done. Public health labs like DHEC, clinical labs like you know university labs and places like that, and then commercial labs like Quest and LabCorp. Mm -hmm. You see it tapering off on the far right. That means that they're getting less tests to run, hence less tests being done. 
That's why these numbers look like they're getting better, at least in part. Mm. Okay, so I want to throw that one, want to throw that one in there as well, so that way we can we can see that. So, um, Dr. Mack, I, I think that you know part of this the conversation today has to be about the fact that. Uh, we're looking at numbers that are not telling the full story, uh, you know, because we have the death count, which in according to what you just said is a little bit more accurate than case count. Um, and it's, it's very disheartening to know that we have to live in a time when, you know, deception is the name of the game. And especially since, you um, we're already having issues with people not wanting to test. And the more you hear about the numbers being fewer or, or, you know, that they're dropping or whatever the case is, I think it instills something in the psyche that says with the coronavirus is going away. And that's certainly not the case. So the responsibility is where I'm going. Right. Um, I guess without that, how how can this happen? How can the testing happen without direct support from the federal government? Is it possible? Well, I mean, there's a federal uh, level, there's a state level. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions is, is that, you know, a lot of the places around here were testing so heavy. And so I don't know, they may have exhausted what supplies they have, or they may have said, look, we're not going to test as much now because we know in six weeks we'll be back in cold and flu season and we may not have as many tests. Mm -hmm. but we need to hold back some without using all of it because we don't know um, whether or not we'll, when, when we'll get more tests. Mm -hmm. Certainly the point of care testing where you get um, answers on the test are becoming more and more utilized again they're not as accurate as the nasal swab test, but it's better than nothing. And it gives you um, uh, information pretty readily within 15, 20 minutes in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. The issue is, is that there are people that have gotten tests here in Conway that it's taken over a month for them to get their results. And some yeah. people have not gotten the results yet. Correct. Absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. So so the concern, <laughs> the concern is, is that there's so many factors involved here. It's a political part to it. Um, it's a it's a supply and demand part to it with the act with the you know, access to these tests. Still, the point of care tests will be used, like utilized in offices, but there's a big demand for that. So places getting out, i.e., in the doctor's offices, have not been as as, as readily available and accessible as we thought it may have been. Um, so there's a number of factors that are there, but I guess what I'm trying to say ultimately is when you see stuff that the numbers are dropping down, people just need to be aware and still be on guard that COVID is still here. Mm -hmm. There are various factors as to why they're saying these numbers are getting better, you know, whether it be school, work, political. I mean, heck, we even got Labor Day coming up. So I'm sure that factored into it to some degree, too. Mm hmm. So, so, you know, with people trying to get people to come to the beach, but it, when you see a drop happen like that, that fast, you get really concerned about the numbers. Mm -hmm. You knew there was going to be an issue when the, when the president said that hospital data needed to go away directly from the CDC to health and human services in DC. So we already knew the hospital data was eventually going to get a little muddy. The CDC readily admits that they aren't, don't have that data as accurately because they don't get the data directly anymore. Mm -hmm. um, wow. But again, the number of the amount of testing, I mean, I, I mean, you see it. Mm -hmm. Do you hear about as many community tests as we've had? No, back I, we're having problems finding it. Exactly. Right. I mean, I, people right. text me all the time wanting to know where right. the testing happening and you we can't didn't have to do, we, we didn't have to do that much in in june and july did we correct right so that's the thing is that they're testing less i'm not saying they're not testing but then they're, they're testing far less than they did mm -hmm. that, and was done um in june and july and that's a fact mm -hmm. now we're coming up on as you mentioned before cold and flu season and 
um, you know, just trying to envision what that is going to look like with a layer of COVID-19 on top of it. Uh, will it be, I'm sure that the narrative will be even, um, even, you know, worse come cold and flu season from certain entities in terms of dismissing any coronavirus numbers as just the flu or just colds or, or whatever. So, um, you know, doc, what, aside from just making sure that we're still following the numbers as, as closely as possible, uh, and, and knowing that what we're hearing is not the full story, what can we expect when this thing hits cold and flu season? What, what do you, env you know, predict it will look like? I envision that, you know, if we're not continuing to be as vigilant with these masks over the next uh, two to six, two to eight weeks, that the numbers are going to continue to go up. Um, I think that that, you know, it's going to be tough in a lot of cases to determine whether or not, you know, it's common cold, flu, pneumonia, strep uh, or COVID. Mm -hmm. I mean, patients are going to come in with similar symptoms and a lot of these symptoms do overlap mm -hmm. if you have symptoms at all. So, you know, again, it's going to be it's going to be an in interesting to say the least. Um you know, I, I'm just I'm concerned with people who have chronic medical conditions. I'm concerned with people who um, may have to decide whether they're going to pay their bills or get all of their medicines. Um, I'm concerned. And that, that leads to another point about these. I've got a number of patients who are having a heck of a time getting them medicines that come through the mail. Um, that is, is absolutely a serious. It's absolutely a travesty. And, you know, I've got a number of patients as well as colleagues of mine, physicians whose patients are, 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 are not getting their medicine time. I have one colleague that that's um, that told me that um, her patient was supposed to get insulin shipped on dry ice on a Friday. She didn't get it until the following Thursday. The ice was melted and the insulin was bad. Oh, my gosh. So not only does that, did that have to be thrown out? but the person didn't have insulin. So they had to go to the pharmacy and pay a higher price because a lot of these people's insurances are tied to benefits when they get the medicines through the mail. Mail, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's, it's usually cheaper, if not free, um, uh, when they get it through the mail, as opposed to going to the pharmacy specifically. And a lot of times that's just the way the medicine benefit plan is set up for the insurance. Mm -hmm. So again, when you have a hard time getting stuff through the mail, it's going to be tough. And so, you know, that's a big concern. And again, as it gets closer to election time, unfortunately, that's probably going to get worse. Well, guess what? It's cold and flu season. Mm -hmm. You got diabetics that aren't getting their medicines like they're supposed to. And it's tough. It's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. Right. Well, <clears throat> uh, I mentioned uh, as we were starting the show that, you know, uh, school is starting, colleges are uh, restarting um, even as early as this coming Monday. And of course, we've seen reports across the nation of colleges basically opening and closing uh, mm -hmm. within a matter of days. And um, you, do you think there were, will be a time when, you know, some, some, the light bulb will go on in somebody's mind <laughs> that pretty much uh, leads us to make sure we're having mandatory testing, just like uh, Sean says, you know, that it, it needs to be mandatory, especially when you're returning to the schools and, uh, you know, uh, places of employment that have large numbers of people. Right. And, you know, I'm personally concerned because of the, uh, you know, the narrative that's out there that says that, you know, we're now moving from, uh, you know, the, the high risk area into the medium risk area, knowing that those numbers are probably not accurate. Right. So, you know, is, do you think that there's a possibility that mandatory testing could happen? Uh, and, and do you feel that it should be necessary? I, I think it should be necessary, but the problem again is supply and demand. I mean, where are you going to get these tests from? It's going right. to be a cost to do these tests. I know through the, um, 
you know, the affiliation that I have with local university, we were able to kind of get get some stuff done for the athletes. But, you know, just then it's, it's going to be tough. I mean, that's a supply and demand thing. Not to mention, it's going to be hard to get these point of care tests that can give you um, the results instantly. I mean, the manufacturers have the capability, but the problem is just producing these machines in a mass amount. Right now, a lot of them are going to hospitals, military, and even starting to go to a lot of the nursing homes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm just thinking that it's kind of crazy. You know, we're hearing a lot about, um, you know, the, the push for vaccines and treatments, yet we don't want to have a push to test to make sure that we understand what's going on with people, whether, you know, as far as if they're COVID positive or not. Uh, it just seems a little cart before horse and definitely backwards, you know. Uh, <clears throat> but, um, you know, I guess all that we can do is, is stay vigilant and, you know, make sure that we're doing our part. Uh, you know, in the past few days, I can say that, you know, everywhere that I've been, uh, actually with the exception of today, uh, I, I, I had to go to a local retailer and, you know, just about everyone in this particular store had on masks, except for some young people who came in. So that, you know, makes me a little nervous, especially with college restarting and all of that. Right. And um, right. you know, I've heard that there's some establishments in Horry County uh, and, you know, their business is through the roof and that's probably what they want. But I'm, I, you know, venture to believe that they're, people probably aren't social distancing. They aren't doing the, you know, the things that they're supposed to do, even if they want to get out and do things. So, right. um, you know, it's very possible that we're going to see some large resurgence and, in the number of cases, but will we ever know? <laughs> right. Know? I mean, you know, we'll never it, know. Right. I mean, you know, <laughs> you're right. And the concern is, is that when the number of testing is being done less, you're not going to know. Mm -hmm. And so, so with that, you know, being said, you know, the most that you can tell folks is just to make sure that you protect yourself, you wear your mask and that you, um, that you are, uh, that you, you know, you're, you're just protecting yourself and being vigilant. Mm -hmm. um, there's another question in the thread. Uh, Sean is on it today. Mm -hmm. he, where, yeah. Where are the test manufacturers? That's a good question. Um, um, you know, they're, they're, a lot of the companies are U.S. companies. Some of them are international companies. But again, it takes time for these for these for these tests and these um, testing protocols and the accuracy to be validated. See, the problem was initially, as you and I were talking, April, when we first started doing these shows, there were a number of people that were doing tests that were, you know, uh, quote unquote, black market tests that mm -hmm. hit, pulled off because they weren't, you know, they didn't meet the mustard of being uh, sensitive and, and reliable on what they were supposed to measure. Mm -hmm. And so, again, these tests take time to actually, you know, manufacture to make sure that they're given the most accurate uh, information as possible. You need these tests to be, you know, really over 90, 95 percent, it's close to 95, 97 percent accurate as you can get them. And it does take some time for that to happen. Um, I know there are tests, there are manufacturers that are out that are doing it. But again, you know, if the government's not really pushing for these tests to be done and testing to be done, then it's not going to be a big emphasis for it. Mm -hmm. Right now, the emphasis seems to be on vaccines. The problem is, is there's a number of people that are not going to go for these vaccines, unfortunately. Correct. And, you know, again, that's a whole nother topic and a whole nother show about the vaccines. But, you know, again, right now, just getting a handle on it. If we can just get people to just do their part, mm -hmm. wear these masks, the physical and social distance, distance. I mean, it's amazing that we're still talking about this and it's amazing just looking at the people that I see around in different places that are not wearing masks. Mm -hmm. Well, how, how, how can, how can these numbers have dropped off when I haven't seen that many more people wearing masks, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, so the, the, the thing about it is, it's just, you know, being, you know, vigilant, being, you know, adamant, and just being persistent with what you're trying to do to protect yourself and your families. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's that's about all we can do at this point. 
Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I wish we could muster up a little bit more energy from somewhere. But, you know, when, when we have the backstage conversations, it really does dig into your psyche as you think about, you know, how uh, how everything is happening and what um, the fact that, you know, that we're there's a lot of smoke and mirrors and things going on that just it's so absolutely unnecessary and definitely in my mind not a, not patriotic not american not looking out for the people of the land and um and yet it's happening and it's being allowed and so right. you know that and that's i think that's the the worst part of it that it's yeah it's one thing that it's it's happening but it's being allowed mm -hmm. so um you know but that's that's a a fight that uh we need to take to the to the polls right. <laughs> i'll just say that but right. uh yeah I mean, now, now there have been some reports that, you know, some contact tracing is linked, um, you know, cases in other states um, where people went to the big bike rally in Sturgis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sturgis. And, I mean, like every, yeah, quarter, yeah. quarter of a million, quarter of a million people estimated go there annually. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of those people were not wearing masks. Now, I'm not just throwing Sturgis under the bus, right. but it is what it is. Yeah. Anytime you have a large gathering of people, there's going to be an issue. Absolutely. I mean, heck, at the racetrack here in, in, in Myrtle Beach, they had a, the last farewell race, mm -hmm. over 3,000 people. Mm -hmm. The pictures I saw, I didn't see anybody wearing masks. And there was very little social distancing, if any at right. all. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, you know, when that kind of stuff happens and that kind of stuff's allowed to happen without any recourse, People are going to do what they're going to do. Unfortunately, it affects the community. Unfortunately, it affects those people who are in front line. I've got now over 100 patients with COVID-19. And, you know, it's, it's just like, it's amazing to me. Now, thank God, 99% of them lived. 98% of them lived. But, you know, again, the one that passed away happened to be a relative. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, it's 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 worrisome that this stuff is happening during the summertime. Mm -hmm. came, I was like, oh, it won't be a problem during the hot months. Right. But we hadn't even gotten through a, a, a winter yet with knowing about COVID. Now, it probably, right. it right. probably was here in last winter. We just didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. And that's my belief. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So, so, and I, and I mean, I, I've had, I had patients last winter towards the end of winter that came in and they were sick, but everything I tested them for was negative. Well, we didn't have COVID testing. We didn't correct. know about COVID. Correct. Tests. correct. So, so, so looking back on it in hindsight, certainly I believe it was here. Certainly. Certainly going back just as a refresher, um, the cases that were seen on the West Coast appeared to have more of a variant from China. The cases that were from New York had, you know, appeared to be more of a European variant. Mm -hmm. So, again, what does that mean? It means it was probably here for a lot longer than we thought. So, you know, again, you know, it, it's, it's just one of those things where we have to be vigilant. COVID's not going anywhere. I don't think it'll be as as deadly or as destructive. Eventually, those numbers are going to go down. Mm -hmm. But again, in 2022, 2022, we're still going to be talking about a COVID-19 vaccine. Mm -hmm. I think this will morph into just like we're talking about a flu vaccine, there yeah. will be a COVID vaccine. Just like we're talking about a pneumonia vaccine, there will be a COVID vaccine. A hundred years ago, we had the Spanish flu which which sparked you know vaccination programs the thought was once a flu vaccine was um introduced which was introduced in the late 30s early 40s that there will be no more flu mm -hmm. we're still talking about the flu 70 years 80 years later we're still talking about the flu correct so i don't think COVID's is going anywhere i don't think it'll be as deadly i don't think it'll be as destructive i don't think it'll be as disruptive 10 years from now, but I think there will still be talk about COVID. Well, uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, you know, Dr. Mack and I are just kind of 
filtering through our thoughts right now. Uh, you know, no special guest today, no special guest topic. Uh, we are still working on getting a, a, a guest from Horry County School District to come in and, and talk to us. And hopefully we can do that uh, maybe in the next week, uh, right before school starts. And, um, you know, if there's any other information that you all would like for us to share, we can do some research and uh, find out as much as possible. But, uh, you know, pretty much what's happening now is that... Um, you know, he's reporting what he can report, uh, considering the fact that there has been, uh, you know, a, a curve on the the numbers and the way they're being reported. So, uh, you know, that's that's real. That's the reality of it all. Uh, I have a, a couple of announcements that I want to share, community announcements. Uh, Dr. Mattis, thank you for taking time to inform us. One of the Facebook users said, and yeah, I mean, it, we're going to come whether we have, you know, five minutes worth of information or 500 minutes worth of information. You know, it's, right, right. it's just something that, you know, we just need to do. And it, and I don't think it's, um, you know, it's not a problem at all. It's just, uh, you know, we've been taking this in for so long and you would hope that there would be a little bit more light at the end of the tunnel. But, uh, you know, it appears that it's getting foggier and foggier for, for a number of reasons, not because we're not reporting what we know. So uh, but uh, there is a, a great program. I'm just going to switch gears a little bit. There's a great program that's happening uh, over um, the weekend and into next week. And let me pull up this information here. And I uh, want to know, uh, well, I would like for everyone to know about the program because it's it's real important that our young people are involved with these programs that are being put together by uh, people in the community who, you know, just want to make sure that they are exposed to a lot of opportunities to uh, grow in, in education. And so Optimism Preventive Services is having a virtual career day featuring Boeing on uh, August the 26th, and I believe that's a Wednesday, uh, from 11.30 to 12.30. So it's it's one hour. I think they're calling it the power hour. And basically, uh, Boeing will be talking to any of the participants uh, about STEM, so that's science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, there's going to be some fun activities that will be facilitated by Boeing Boeing volunteers, if you are interested and want to register your student, your young person uh, who's in grades nine through 12, so that's freshmen to seniors in high school, uh, I'm going to post the flyer to the thread when we're done. Uh, or you can get in touch with Denise Chapman, and she's the uh, president and CEO of Optimism Preventive Services, and she can give you more information. But uh, it's free. It's a free program. So you definitely want to make sure that you sign uh, your, your, your young people up for this amazing opportunity. Uh, also, what's going on this weekend, uh, the Eddie Lake Cemetery Cleanup Project is happening on Saturday uh, afternoon. And if you want more information about that particular program, you can contact uh, Kevin or Gina Mishu, and they will be able to give you more information. Uh, I think I have Gina's, um, uh, may have Gina's number, and I can uh, also post that to the thread as well. But, uh, you know, uh, we've been covering the Eddie Lake Cemetery uh, cleanup and discoveries on the Whittemore Community Magazine. And on uh, this past Monday, actually had Grant Mishu back. Uh, to talk a little bit more about the genealogy and, and DNA um, uh, tie in to, to, you know, everything. Uh, and so, you know, it, it was a very interesting conversation. Uh, we didn't get to uh, uh, the, the genealogy results that we wanted to share, but uh, we are possibly working on a part three to this conversation. I don't think you can ever talk too much about shaking your family tree because you need to discover who your people are. Okay. You need to know, uh, Dr. Matt, do you know all your people? You might. Be I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't know all my people. I have I, no idea. I, I met a lot more over the past five years though. Mm -hmm. it, it's ironic because in my family, a lot of the, a lot of the, well, a lot of the people in my family have had bigger families. So we can have a big family union just with the immediate people. Right. Then we started adding more people in and realizing, yeah, I got a whole group of cousins from uh, Florence and, and, and Darlington County that I didn't even know existed. And now we, we, we talk and interact um, 
regularly mm -hmm. and have our kids uh, doing likewise. Absolutely. So uh, it's pretty fascinating. And, and you know, there's some uh, amazing discoveries that can be made whenever you, uh, you know, do your your uh, your DNA test and that's linked to all of the, you know, the genealogy studies and all that. So uh, it looks like your mom is posting a phone number for me. Uh, Ms. Mack, whose phone number is that? Is that Kevin Mishu's phone number? Let me know. And uh, and if so, then, uh, you know, we can definitely share it with everyone. Uh, I want to give you an update on the summer literacy program that is co-sponsored by the Whittemore Community Magazine and uh, some uh, very involved individuals from the community who cut that. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, who come together to make sure that uh, we had a, a summer reading initiative for uh, some young people. And we actually have two groups. One group uh, is uh, comprised of, of young people ages eight to 12 and the other uh, group is ages 13 to 17, but we're all reading Ghost Boys, uh, which is the book uh, that we adopted for this particular initiative. And we're so excited that we are actually in our third week now. Time flies. I mean, we just started this thing and it, I can't believe we're already in our third week, but we, we have uh, 30 participants and uh, they're in the activity phase now where they have some activities that they have to complete and submit to um, one of the organizers, Ms. Marjorie McIver, and then they'll be doing presentations on the 29th of August and September the 5th. So we're excited for these young people. Uh, we've been working hard to uh, raise funds to make sure that we have the, uh, the stipends that we want to distribute to them at the end of the program to help them with school supplies or whatever it is that they need going into the school year. And so that, you know, if you uh, want to give to this uh, initiative, you can certainly contact us at the Whittemore Community Magazine. You can go to our website, wcmagazine.net, and find out more information about the entire program. You can contact me or uh, you can contact uh, Marjorie McIver if you have her information. And we will uh, certainly be able to direct you to uh, either, you know, where you need to uh, send donations or who you need to talk to if you need more information. But we just want to thank everyone who has donated thus far. And we certainly want to thank all of our participants, our young people who are up early on a Saturday and uh, they're very attentive and uh, we just can't wait to see what they're going to do as far as these presentations are concerned. Uh, pretty soon we'll talk a little bit more about uh, a math initiative that's going to roll out as well. So we'll be able to talk a little bit about that, I think, uh, and um, give some more information about that. If there's still some room for registrations on that, I got to double check that before I actually uh, give more information. But uh, Dr. Mack, I think that's about all that I have as far as uh, community announcements are concerned. Uh, let me check the uh, the network page. And uh, there was a question, um, Wendy Willis, my, my good friend and, and former uh, advertising colleague from uh, the Sun News. I, I tell you, the Sun News is one of the, the best jobs that uh, as an advertising executive that I have ever had. The people that I met there are truly family, We've known them for you know over 20 years. And Wendy tunes in every single week from New York uh, to, and she, she's fabulous, you guys, interior design just whiz guru or whatever. But um, Wendy came in a little late and she was asking about the Ori County numbers. Okay. So um, if you will, uh, while I'm looking for this other information, uh, her question was, uh, what are the numbers in South Carolina and specifically in Ori County? Okay. So uh, again, over the last week, uh, the number of cases in South Carolina have gone up um, from 104,000 to 109,000. And number of deaths have gone up from around 2,200 to around 2,500 over the last week. In Horry County, the number of cases have gone from around 8,700 up to around 9,000. And the number of deaths in Horry County have gone from 61, I'm assuming 161 to 177. But again, the number of cases, a little misleading because there are less people that are testing. There's less testing events. Uh, and so overall, there's less people that are being tested. So the numbers are a little bit, a little bit um, off, um, I, I truly believe. Now, the other thing is, is that we talked about this a little bit earlier, a couple of weeks ago, that it's thought for every 
for every um, every one person that's positive, there's probably eight to ten more people that are positive that uh, that don't know it. So mm-hmm. those numbers can get pretty, pretty, pretty amazing when you think about that. And that's pretty much held held true and reliable um, um, over the last uh, couple months with those kind of numbers like that. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Wendy, hopefully that's the information that you're looking for. And um, I'm just going to kind of go through the thread real quick and see if there are any other questions or comments. If uh, anyone has any community news or anything that you'd like for me to uh, make mention of, you can text me at 843-457-5308. Most of you probably already have my number, but I'll say it again, 843-457-5308, and I'll, I'll get your announcement on right now. Uh, I think that there's, um, I have a text here about a question. Okay. Um Oh, here we go. Okay, so oh, Denise is watching. There's a, a question that she has. She says, uh, please, well, it's a comment. Please share a little about symptoms while in quarantine. So, yeah, what what are what would people experience if they're, I'm um, assuming you mean um, positive in quarantine, Denise? So, yeah, what are some things that they can expect from? Uh, well, um, mostly uh, tired, fatigue, cough. Just real bad muscle aches, cramping, like the flu, symptoms similar to the flu. Um, also, we know about the issues with uh, lack of taste and smell, which a lot of people are talking about. Um, but just generalize, uh, the best I can say is some people will say, um, I feel like I've been hit by a Mack truck. I had two people actually who I, who I saw today. Um, that was their words exactly. And that's a pretty common analogy that uh, that I will hear is just saying I feel like I've been hit by a Mack truck. Mm-hmm. Tired, fatigue, run down, no energy, and things like that. Okay. Okay. Appetite being down, some shortness of breath. A lot of it too, though, and that's a good question, Miss Denise. A lot of that too depends on what other medical problems people already have. That makes sense. Or, Right. So in other words, if if a person has a history of asthma, emphysema, they're likely to have more um, respiratory symptoms. You know, if it's a heart patient, they're likely to have some more sim- symptoms similar to cardiac symptoms. You know, if you've got a person that has diabetes, they're likely to have more fluctuations in, 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 in their blood sugars hmm. and symptoms that go along with diabetes. So because there is no cure for COVID, there's no real treatment for COVID, what you're doing is basically treating the symptoms as they come up. The symptoms typically go along with what symptoms and what conditions you already have. Mm-hmm. Okay. And there was one question, I guess, from Miss Wendy that asked, and I was kind of hitting on this. So for example, um, if there's reported 9,000 people with, um, with COVID, in in um in Ori County, there's probably fifty five to sixty thousand people that actually have it estimated. So these numbers are coming from CDC. They're coming from World Health Organization. They're coming from Johns Hopkins. They're coming from the Department of Informatics at the University of Washington, which looks at bio statistics and bio statistical information. That that's the kind of numbers we're looking at. So if there's nine around nine thousand people that are positive in Ori County, there's probably between fifty-five to sixty thousand in Ori County that actually have COVID nineteen. Again, a lot of these people are younger people. A lot of these people are people that are asymptomatic, are very minimal symptoms. So that's the kind of numbers that we're looking at. Um, I just found, and you guys may hear my dog barking in the background. So I think somebody's knocking at the door. Wow maybe thunder and I don't know what she's barking at, but anyway, uh, so just excuse her. Uh, I, uh, there was something that was posted, uh, in the network about a free drive through COVID-19 testing happening in Myrtle beach, Thailand's health and the South Carolina DHEC partner, uh, will conduct a community mobile COVID-19 testing event. Uh, testing is set for two to 5 PM every Friday 
on the Myrtle Beach campus of Ori Georgetown Technical College. Right. Each event will accommodate 250 people. Right. You'll get and, a free test without leaving your car. Right. And and Tyler's has done a wonderful they have, job. They've done a fabulous I mean, job. I, I, yeah. I've had the opportunity to work with uh, with Dr. Harmon um, and Amy uh, at Tyler's, and they've been wonderful to work with. Uh, with some other projects that I've been working with specifically through Coastal. So I have to give them a shout out and um, and thank them for that. Um, but again, even with their numbers, I mean, because they were doing they were doing testing at the Pelican Stadium, where mm -hmm. I think they were doing over a thousand people. Mm -hmm. So even with that, you know, still, and again, I don't know, it may be a supply demand thing. I don't know. I mean, you know, again, certainly, um, Certainly, there's probably not an, an, an you know an unlimited supply of tests. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly, how you handle that, how many you do, how often you do it, certainly that that probably has to play some factor in this too. Mm -hmm. But just be aware that these numbers dropping off on cases is not apples to apples because there are not as many people being tested now as there were four, six, eight weeks ago. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that that's just that that's just a fact. I mean, you know, it's not trying to be cynical about it. It is it is what it is. If we were testing with the same frequency, if we were testing and having the same number, then that would be different. And I don't mm -hmm. that's the case. I don't believe it. I know it's not the case. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, um uh Again, I keep shifting back and forth uh, because there are things that are kind of popping up now. Uh, some things that I uh, want to just let the community know about. Uh, there's a question that's been posed about whether or not any uh, churches are doing uh, any or are offering any tutoring for, uh, you know, the, the students who are going back to school, any additional tutoring after school or, uh, you know, during the day or whatever the case is. So if your church is doing something locally, particularly in the Horry County area, uh, Horry County and Georgetown County areas, uh, let, let me know, drop something on my page or send me a, a messenger um, inbox message. And uh, I'll be sure to get that information out and up and, and do some research on it as well. And then, uh, Charlie's Place in Myrtle Beach, they are looking for photographs for the historic site plans that they're putting together to, their, you know, because they're kind of, uh, they're working on that area as a, a museum, that Charlie's Place project. So their goal is to display a collection of photographs from the local community. Uh, and these are photographs from the times that, uh, the time that Charlie's Place existed, that it was open uh, you know, for travelers. So if you have any information, any photographs, anything you'd like to share or donate uh, to this project, you can contact Frida Funny. Uh, she is with the city of Myrtle Beach and her number is 843-918-1056. Or you can email her uh, a funny and her last name is spelled F-U-N-N-Y-E at cityofmyrtlebeach.com. And again, uh, that's information that's posted in the network. So uh, from time to time out, you know, we'll do some more community stuff, especially when Dr. Mack and I are just, you know, sharing COVID-19 updates and we don't have a special guest uh, because we definitely want you all to be informed about uh, what's happening around town and all that good stuff. So Dr. Mack, uh, you know, I just want to thank the audience that, uh, you know, was here with us today to share this conversation, comments and questions and, uh, you know, all of our, our loyal viewers over the weeks. Thank you so much. Continue to pass on the word that Dr. Mack is still giving COVID-19 updates. And if they want the real deal, they need to tune in on Fridays at four o'clock so that they can hear, uh, you know, the, the latest on what's going on in, in terms of developments. And uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Mack. I appreciate it. Thank you, April. Thank you, Miss April. Appreciate yep. it. Appreciate absolutely. It. Absolutely. So uh, with that being said, we hope that everyone has a, a safe weekend. Please, uh, you know, mask up and uh, wash hands, mask up and uh, make sure that. Oh, you got one more thing. I, I, always, I, always, want to, I always want to end on a good note. I always want to end on a good note. Yes, absolutely. I always want to end on a positive note. Mm -hmm. um, over the last week, in the, in the world, worldwide numbers, the number of recovered people have gone from 14 million to 15.6. 
Okay. In the last week. Last week, up a million and some change. Okay. In the United States, the number of recovered have gone from 2.8 million to 3.1 million. Okay. And the number of recovered in South Carolina have gone from 42,000 to over 45,000. So, I, you know, I want to make sure that we're giving positivity on the show as well as our, our real, real uh, fact information. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much. And everyone, again, please stay safe. And uh, we will see you next week, God willing. Okay. Thank All you. Right. So have a good one.